Ai, arratsaldion, Jon Andreok. Bueno, lenik eta behin e, eskerrak eman nahi dizkiot e, Amnesty Internationali, e, ba ekitaldi hau antolatu duelako. Eta eskerrak eta zorionak ere bai e, Rey eta Cherili e, egiten duten e, lan bikainagatik. Zorionak baitare amnistiari Madriden antolatu den nazioarteko bosgarren e, kongreso e, kongresoaren gatik. Herrialde gutxi dira kongresu hau apoiatzen dutenak, Espainia zaparte, Frantzia, Suiza eta Noruega, espero dezagun seigarren ekitaldirako, seigarren kongresurako gehiago e, izatea. Tenemos que hablar sobre la pena de muerte. Eh, una muerte que todavía es legal en muchos países, en demasiados países. Y la pena de muerte, hay que decirlo bien alto, es una auténtica aberración desde el punto de vista de los derechos humanos. Ofende al Estado democrático de derecho eh, y atenta, hay que decirlo, quiero decirlo con claridad, eh, los fundamentos básicos del Estado democrático de derecho. Porque el fundamento principal de un Estado democrático de derecho es el respeto a los derechos humanos. Y la pena de muerte es un atentado flagrante, brutal, contra los derechos humanos. Por tres razones. En primer lugar, porque atenta contra el derecho humano más elemental, que es el derecho a la vida. Matar una persona es matar una persona. Y punto. Y quitarle el derecho a la vida a una persona es quitarle, vulnerarle su derecho fundamental más importante, porque sin, él, sin la vida el resto de los derechos desaparecen, obviamente. Pero es un atentado también contra los derechos humanos, porque la pena de muerte es una pena irreversible. Si a una persona le quitamos la vida, no hay manera de corregir los errores judiciales. Y de esto nos va a hablar Rey. Se considera que hay 100 personas que, habiendo sido condenados por error judicial, se han librado de la pena de muerte. ¿Cuántos inocentes han sido ejecutados, han sido matados, habiendo sido inocentes? Por tanto, la pena de muerte es una pena aberrante, es una pena, insisto, que atenta contra los derechos humanos. Y una tercera razón, una tercera razón por la cual podemos sostener y tenemos que sostener que la pena de muerte atenta contra los derechos humanos. Y es que la justicia, la aplicación de la justicia frente al delito, frente al delincuente, en un Estado democrático debe basarse en dos principios y nunca, nunca en la venganza, en dos principios. Uno de ellos es, obviamente, que el que comete un delito tiene que pagar eh, una, una pena, una pena eh, por el delito que ha cometido frente a la víctima y frente a la sociedad en su conjunto. Una pena que ha de ser razonable, que ha de ser proporcional. Pero hay un segundo principio, y es el principio de la reinserción social. Por mucho que nos duela, a veces, eh, ante, ante crímenes horrendos, ante personas que han cometido asesinatos inmundos, el último pues, este energúmeno machista que ha matado a dos mujeres o más, no sabemos, en Bilbao, por mucho que nos duela, por mucho que nos parezca, eh, digamos, eh, atentatorio contra, contra nuestros instintos más primarios, los instintos son instintos. Y el Estado democrático de derecho siempre tiene que hacer valer la fuerza de la razón. Y la fuerza de la razón nos dice que hasta el peor de los criminales tiene derecho a una segunda oportunidad, tiene derecho a ser reinsertado. Tiene derecho a reconocer el mal que ha hecho y, en su caso, a arrepentirse o, por lo menos, a resarcir por ese mal. Ha de dársele esa oportunidad. Por tanto, un segundo principio de un Estado democrático de derecho, en todo lo relacionado con las leyes penales, ha de ser la posibilidad de la reinserción. Y, obviamente, la pena de muerte cercena eh, de raíz esta, esta posibilidad. Afortunadamente, eh, la tendencia abolicionista de la pena de muerte avanza, poquito a poco, pero avanza. Pero eh, debemos dar algunos datos, y es que el, en el, año, el año pasado 600 personas fueron ejecutadas 
por la aplicación de la pena de muerte en 21, en 21 países. Son datos, eh, digamos, contrastados, o mejor dicho, datos que se basan en fuentes oficiales. Pero hay algunos países, como China, que no da datos. Y se sabe que en China eh, se aplica la pena de muerte. Por tanto, son más de 600, sin lugar a ninguna duda. El año pasado se impusieron 1.722 condenas de muerte en, 50, en 58 países. Algo menos que el año anterior, pero 1.722. Y se calcula que en más de 50 países hay 23.000 personas en el corredor de la muerte. 23.000 personas. Decía que hay una tendencia a favor de la abolición. Eh, uno de cada diez países eh, ejecutó condenas de muerte. La buena noticia es que nueve de diez no, pero uno de diez sí. Y hubo pasos atrás el año pasado, también hay que decirlo. ¿eh? Se reanudaron las ejecuciones, especialmente en Gambia, en India, en Japón y en Pakistán. Y hay que constatar también el alarmante aumento de ejecuciones de las que se tiene noticia en Irak, un país también eh, opaco, pero que ejecutó la pena de muerte. Bueno, eh, cada año, seguimos con las buenas noticias, entre dos y tres países eliminan la pena de muerte de sus legislaciones. Durante el año pasado no hubo ninguna ejecución en 174 países de, o estados de 193 que componen Naciones Unidas. Ahora bien, hay que constatar como puntos negros eh, que estado, en Estados Unidos todavía se sigue eh, aplicando la pena de muerte y en el marco de Europa, de la Gran Europa, en Bielorrusia, eh, es legal la pena de muerte. Ahora bien, eh, hemos de constatar que en 1948, cuando se aprobó la Declaración Universal de Derechos Humanos por parte de Naciones Unidas, eran muchos más los países eh, que aplicaban, que utilizaban la pena de muerte y seguramente eh, las, quienes redactaron esta declaración eh, se darían con un canto en los dientes eh, si vieran eh, la situación de este año, eh, bueno, de este año, del año pasado, en el que desde aquel entonces se pues, han producido notables avances, pero insuficientes porque el objetivo debe ser para quienes luchamos a favor de los derechos humanos la erradicación total y absoluta de la pena de muerte en todos los países, estados del mundo. En el campo del derecho se han producido avances. En España la Constitución prohíbe en el artículo 15 la pena de muerte, pero establece una salvedad y es en caso de guerra eh, en que se aplicaría el Código, eh, el código eh, Militar. Afortunadamente, y Merced, entre otras, eh, entre otras organizaciones, Amnistía Internacional, se consiguió la eliminación de la pena de muerte también del Código eh, Militar en 1995. En el campo de los tratados internacionales, del derecho de la Unión Europea, del derecho internacional de los derechos humanos eh, se están produciendo avances y en cada vez más eh, normas, más disposiciones, más declaraciones eh, se contempla o se establece la prohibición de la pena de muerte, en algunos casos con excepciones. Por ejemplo, en el Pacto Internacional de los Derechos Civiles y Políticos, aprobado en 1989, se establece eh, esta prohibición salvo en tiempos de guerra. O el Convenio Europeo de Derechos Humanos eh, establece la prohibición en su protocolo eh, decimotercero en toda circunstancia. O la Convención Americana de Derechos Humanos de 1990 también establece esa prohibición, salvo en tiempos de guerra. En la Unión Europea esa prohibición está recogida en la Carta de Derechos Fundamentales eh, de la Unión Europea. Y el Servicio Europeo de Acción Exterior, una especie de Ministerio de Asuntos Exteriores de la Unión Europea, en sus objetivos programáticos, eh, tiene incluido la lucha contra la pena de, de muerte. Quiero señalar también eh, un aspecto eh, al que no se le da la vida de importancia, y es que las condiciones, eh, las condiciones en, las que, en las que se gestiona y se aplica la pena de muerte suponen en muchos casos la vulneración de otro derecho fundamental de la persona, que es eh, el derecho a no sufrir torturas, el derecho a la integridad física y moral. Porque en muchos casos eh, la pena de muerte supone una tortura eh, para la persona condenada a muerte y también para sus familiares. Las condiciones de reclusión, en, muchas, en muchos casos, son ejemplos de trato o pena cruel, inhumano o degradante durante la reclusión. El confinamiento del detenido en una celda oscura, el uso de esposas para inmovilizarlo o la negación de lo indispensable para satisfacer sus necesidades básicas. Hemos de constatar también la angustia de estar esperando a ser ejecutado, que ha sido calificada en muchas circunstancias como una pena cruel, inhumana y degradante, porque el Estado de Derecho en, muchos, en muchas ocasiones 
eh, incurre en una terrible paradoja. De una parte, se le dan recursos y eh, opciones para poder recurrir la condena a muerte a la persona condenada, lo cual alarga eh, muchísimo el procedimiento judicial y eso acarrea una situación de, de angustia eh, que ha de calificarse en justicia, en puridad, como auténtica tortura psicológica para quien la padece. Y en muchas ocasiones eh, la pena de muerte se ejecuta en secreto, no se da información a los, a los familiares, eh, en algunos países incluso eh, no se permite la última, la última visita o la comunicación de la persona que va a morir al día siguiente con sus, queres, con sus, seres, con sus seres queridos, con su pareja, con sus familiares, etcétera, etcétera. También quiero señalar eh, un aspecto que muchas veces eh, cuando se habla de la pena de muerte se pone encima de la mesa y es eh, la presión de la opinión pública. Algunos defensores de la pena de muerte dicen no, es que la opinión pública lo pide para algunos crímenes, para algunos delitos. Bueno, en una sociedad eh, democrática yo creo que es muy importante hablar de todo, efectivamente, eh, y introducir, e introducir la perspectiva de los derechos humanos en todos los debates. He dado argumentos, he puesto argumentos encima de la mesa para que eh, el derecho penal, el derecho punitivo, contemple siempre la perspectiva de los derechos humanos. Y hay que hablar en esos términos, hay que hacer mucha pedagogía social, porque eh, el fundamento principal de un Estado democrático de derecho es, lo digo una vez más, la defensa de los derechos humanos. Cueste lo que cueste, y esto supone unos valores, cultivar unos valores, supone cultivar una ética y supone eh, abordar eh, las cuestiones más espinosas desde la perspectiva de los, de los derechos humanos. También debe decirse, de todas maneras, eh, cuando hablamos de derecho penal, que eh, por parte de los, de los expertos eh, en, en ciencias políticas y en derecho constitucional, se dice que el, el derecho penal, que los códigos penales, mejor dicho, en una democracia, constituyen la segunda ley más importante después de una Constitución, porque establecen justamente eh, digamos, la Constitución en negativo, es decir, cuáles son los límites que los ciudadanos no deben cruzar porque ello acarrea la imposición de una pena. Supone eh, el, los códigos penales el establecimiento de unos valores que han de ser eh, valores compartidos, lógicamente, con, con la Constitución. Y algo que no se hace eh, debidamente en las democracias, en muchas democracias, en España desde luego no, es eh, estar evaluando continuamente las leyes penales. Evaluándolas eh, con la participación de expertos, sí, de expertos en criminología, en victimología, en psicología y antropología del delito, pero también de la ciudadanía. Pero continuamente, no cuando se produce un crimen horrendo, sino de manera continua. Esta es una de las, de las tareas que eh, el Parlamento, que las Cortes Generales deberían de tener de manera continua, estar permanentemente evaluando eh, los códigos penales, las leyes penales, para que sean conformes a, los, eh, a las nuevas necesidades, a las nuevas realidades, eh, a los nuevos delitos, a los nuevos perfiles de los, de, de los delitos, pero eso sí, salvaguardando siempre los valores constitucionales, los valores de defensa de los derechos humanos, cueste lo que cueste. Y termino ya. Decía que eh, estamos avanzando poquito a poco, pero avanzando a fin de cuentas, si nos atenemos a los datos eh, globales, en relación a la pena de muerte, que insisto una vez, más, una vez más, desde el punto de vista de los derechos humanos, debemos trabajar para su erradicación total y completa eh, en todos los países eh, del mundo. Quiero agradecer una vez más la labor de eh, las personas activistas a favor de este desideratum, a favor de este objetivo loable, como son Ray y Cheryl, y también quiero agradecer a Amnistía Internacional, no solamente, ya lo he dicho, por haber organizado el acto de hoy, sino porque es uno de los objetivos que desde su fundación ha perseguido y además está obteniendo buenos resultados. Larga vida, por tanto, a Amnistía Internacional, larga vida y, la, y buen trabajo a sus activistas, a ver si conseguimos en el plazo más breve posible ese objetivo al que me he referido. Es que I'm going to start out with a question for you. Could you believe that you could wake up one morning, on a normal day, in your own bed, and by that night you'd be sleeping in prison? It's what happened to me. It happened that fast. It all started on December 29th, 1991. The owner of a local neighborhood cafe found his night manager stabbed to death in the men's bathroom. There was no evidence of a break-in. 
no sign of a robbery. The police initiated this investigation under the assumption it had to be somebody that knew her. They asked the co-workers, who does she like? Who has she been seeing? One of the co-workers mentioned my name. Three hours later, the police showed up at my house to question me about being a boyfriend. I told them I wasn't her boyfriend. I only knew her from going to the bar. She's never been to my house, and I certainly didn't kill her or know why anybody would want to kill her. During that three hours, they took mug shots for pictures of my face, pictures of my chest, took fingerprints, took my shoes. At one point, they even had me bite into a piece of styrofoam. I didn't know what any of this was about. I just cooperated. As I say, I didn't kill her. I was home in bed when the murder happened, and I don't know why anybody would kill her. I only knew her for two months. After three hours, I was taken home. I thought that was the end of it. The next day was a Monday. I'd been working seven years as a mailman. I delivered my mail that day, and when I got home, there was the detective waiting for me. He told me he didn't think I was truthful. He said he wanted to eliminate me as a suspect. Asked me if I'd come downtown for a few more questions. I agreed. Only this time when I got downtown, he showed me a search warrant. A warrant that required me to give a blood sample, a hair sample, and a cast of my teeth. And I was angry about this. This, this seemed a little um, forceful, a little assertive, like he was blaming me. Or, but I cooperated. I'd read the paper. It was signed by a judge. Said they had three hours to take these samples. So I cooperated when he took blood out of both arms. I'm not sure he realized it was the same blood. Cooperated when he took a hair sample. We take a hair sample by pulling it out by the roots from all over your body. Then he took me next door in a bigger room, had a dentist chair there, took casts of my upper teeth, casts of my lower teeth, put plastic apparatus in my mouth and took pictures of them my teeth. And during this time, I was explaining the history of, of my dentition. My teeth weren't always straight and, and even. I, I was in a head-on collision when I was an 18-year-old young man. I woke up the next day in the hospital with my mouth wired shut. I had a broken jaw. It took six weeks for those wires to come off. When they came off, my bottom jaw and my top jaw didn't line up. They had to re-break it and wire it shut for another six weeks. After that was finally over, now I had some gum disease. I had some tooth damage. I had to get bridge work done and root canal work done. Almost 15 years later, those teeth were a little loose. They'd moved around a little bit. So I was careful with my teeth. I wasn't biting into a fresh apple. And for two and a half hours, that dentist was prying around in my mouth. Finally, when that was over, I was taken back next door into this little interrogation room again. I went to sit down. The detective banged on the table, said, look, it's time to come clean. It's time to tell the truth. I know you did it. Why don't you just confess so we can all go home? Now I was angry. My honor, my integrity was something I was always proud of. I spent six years in the U.S. Air Force. I'd had top secret clearance for the job that I did. An honorable discharge. I've been working seven years for the U.S. Postal Service, handing people's mail, their personal property, in and out of their homes. And here's a man that doesn't even know me, calls me a murderer, calls me a rapist, tells me to confess. I came up out of my seat. I told him what I thought of him, what I thought of the police department, what I thought of their investigation. I said, why are you wasting my time? Go find a person that did this. And by the way, your three hours are up. He looked at me. He looked at his watch. He said, look, I'm not going to argue with you. There's other ways to handle this. And he took me home, which is what I wanted. But the next day, I found out what he meant by other ways to handle this. December 31st, 1991, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, just pulled in my driveway after delivering my mail that day. Just stepped out of my car. 
All of a sudden, I heard the screech of brakes, the sound of door slamming, people yelling, freeze, don't move, you're under arrest. I look over, it's a van load of police officers, full ride gear, guns drawn, threw me on the ground, arresting me for murder, kidnapping, and sexual assault, and Kim's death. I was taken to the Maricopa County Jail. It's about the fifth largest jail in all the United States. I knew right away I was around a whole lot of people I was not going to like. But I wasn't worried. I didn't do anything. Nothing could happen to me. You know the first thing I was thinking about while I was in there? Did I lock my car? Who's feeding my dog? I told my family right away not to worry. I didn't do anything. This was all a bad mistake. I'll be out of there any minute. And then it turned into days. And then it turned into weeks. And some of my friends there in Phoenix, Arizona, that were concerned about me being in there, that, that knew an attorney, would send one in to talk to me. The first thing I wanted to know is, how much is this going to cost? And he said, well, you're looking at about a $20,000 retainer, probably another eighty dollars to $100,000 in expenses. And I'm thinking, let me get this straight. I make $30,000 a year at the post office. I bought a house seven years ago for $50,000. And now you want me to come up with $100,000 to pay you to defend me for something I didn't do, and I'm not going to get that money back? He said, yes, Mr. Crone, that's about how it works. And I said, look, I'll be fine. I didn't do anything. Well, I was stupid. I was naive. I was the most vulnerable because I still believed in that system. Finally, I was given what was called a court-appointed attorney. A private attorney had his own private practice, was assigned by the judge to represent me in, in my murder case. Now, maybe he would have been a good, a good lawyer. At the same time he was appointed for me, though, he was given $5,000 by the court to defend me. That was all he was going to get paid, $5,000. You can't even get a divorce for $5,000 in America. So he didn't do anything. He wanted me to take a plea bargain, wanted me to confess and ask for leniency. I refused. Just seven months after they found Kim's body, I was sitting in the courtroom on trial for my life. And I found out why they had me bite into that piece of styrofoam the first day there when I was interrogated. Why they had the dentist chair there the second day. Because as I told you, I didn't kill her. I was not there. The prosecutor hired a bite mark expert. <laughs> Let me put that in quotation marks. A bite mark expert was hired by the prosecutor who testified to marks in the body matched my teeth. My teeth were unique as a result of that car accident. Those marks in the body happened at the time of her death, so that made me, Ray Crone, the murderer. Very professional looking man, very well spoken, very convincing. We later found out that he was also very well paid. Over $50,000 he was paid by the prosecutor for his work in my case. The trial lasted three and a half days. Most of, the most of the testimony was from the police officers and from this expert. When it came time for the defense, I took the stand. I went up and raised my right hand to tell the truth. I answered my attorney's question. When I was done, the prosecutor came up to cross-examine me. He said, so you deny killing Kim and Kona? I said, yes, I do. So you deny being in the CBS lounge? I said, when? He said, the night of the murder, of course, Mr. Crone. From there on, it was an argument back and forth, questioning me, tell, calling me a liar, trying to twist the words around. For two and a half hours, I sat there and went through this ordeal. I'm telling you, when I came down off that witness stand, I, I, I was so confused, so disoriented, I, I almost went over and laid down next to him. It was that bad. Next was my roommate. He was going through a divorce at the time, needed a place to stay. I always had a spare room. 
Almost all his money, paycheck, was going to help support his children. He took the stand. He raised his right hand in that court of law to tell the truth, answered the questions of my attorney, just like me. Then here come the prosecutor up the cross examining. First thing he said was, so you've known Ray Crone a long time, haven't you? My friend Steve said, yes, that's right, 12 years since we were in the Air Force together. And then the prosecutor said, and Ray Crone's always been a good friend to you, always been there in times of need, times of trouble, looked out for you, helped you out. In fact, he's even given you a place to live right now, isn't he? My friend Steve kind of straightened up and said, yes, sir, that's the way kind of guy Ray is. And the prosecutor leaned over and said, you'd lie for him, wouldn't you? Turned and walked away and sat down. That's how he cross-examined my friend, who, like me, took an oath to serve in the United States Air Force, took an oath in that courtroom to tell the truth, and in less than a minute's time, that prosecutor called him a liar, told the jury to ignore what he was going to say. It took the jury just three and a half hours to find me guilty. They convicted me of murder and kidnapping. They acquitted me of this sexual assault. It's hard to understand the prosecutor's theory. The motive, he said, was I went there at closing time. She refused me sex. I forced myself on her, realized what I'd done, and had to kill her to silence her. That's why he alleged that I had killed Kim. And the jury found me innocent of sexual assault. Four months later, I have to go back before this judge for sentencing. The first part is called the aggravating part. It's put on by the prosecution. This is where they argue why this case is so horrible, so outrageous, so in need of a death sentence. He argued this bite mark was excessive pain and suffering that the victim went through from, from bite, being bitten. And the judge ruled that that was aggravating. They have to have one aggravating factor in order to get a death sentence. Then it's the defense's turn. It's called the mitigating part. Mitigate means to lessen, to ease, to, to explain. Normally, mitigating factors are drug or alcohol impairment, uh, history of abuse, mental illness. I'm going to ask you another question. How do you mitigate something you didn't do? How do you show remorse or regret for an act you never committed? It's what I told the judge. It's what I told my attorney. My attorney said, well, we'll bring your friends, your family up and, and testify to your good behavior, your good personality, your good background. I said, you're not bringing my mom, my friends on the stand to be cross-examined by that prosecutor. No. He said, well, you're going to have to tell the judge that. So I told the judge, I said, Your Honor, I have no remorse. I have no regrets. I didn't kill her. You had the wrong person. So I was cold, called a cold-hearted monster, an unremorseful killer, and sentenced to death. I was taken away to a cell on a death row in, in Arizona, a cell the size of, of, most of most of your bathrooms. It was uh, about two by three meters. Cement walls on three sides, steel bars and a heavy metal door on the front. It had a little small square hole. That was where they fed you through. And you better be there when they come around with the food. And I can tell you this, I never got a hot meal on death row. No. They don't let death row prisoners, the animals that they called us, they don't let us work in a kitchen, not where there's too many potential weapons. No. No, the food was prepared in another yard and put in the carts and wheeled over in our hallway and would sit there for hours until they decided to feed us. And when they finally did feed you, you better be there and be ready because if they threw it in through that door and it landed on the floor and spilt, all they did was laugh at you and say, oh, well, you hungry or not? And I beat myself up those first couple nights. Why me? What did I do to deserve this? My family, my friends still stood behind me, believed in me and who I was. My mom sent the Bible in. I found strength in the stories of Job and, and Jonas. Some of the passages that touched me, out of the darkness shall come the light. And I found strength. I, I, I realized if I'm going to fight this system, I better know this system. I started going to the law library. 
started studying law books when they, we were still allowed to in prison. Meanwhile, my case was making its way to the Arizona Supreme Court. At that time, when I was on Arizona's death row, there was 121 other inmates sentenced to death in Arizona. And it takes anywhere from three to five years for the, for the Supreme Court of that state to, to hear your appeal. During that time in my prison cell, in that isolation, no physical contact with any other inmates, I got out of that cell three times a week. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for two hours. I was first completely, completely searched. I was then handcuffed and shackled at the waist and at the ankles, taken outside by two officers, put on a square cement pad about 10 feet square, had, had chain link fence all the way around it across the top. I was put in there for two hours out in the desert. The sun would shine on me, it felt good. It was my escape, my vacation from my little cell. Maybe I could see an airplane fly over, maybe a bird, maybe a, a, a car horn honk, maybe a lawnmower, a dog bark, anything to remind me that I was still a human being, not an animal in a cage destined to be executed. Almost three years went by surviving, existing, my case finally made it to the Arizona Supreme Court. And they overturned my conviction because the prosecutor withheld a, a videotape made by the bite mark expert, a real impressive tape that showed how he matched my teeth to this bite on the body. But they didn't turn it over to us until the very last day before trial. As a defendant, you have a right to know what evidence is going to be used against you. You have a right to receive that evidence in a timely manner so you can prepare your defense. They're not supposed to hide it from you. They're not supposed to destroy it. They're not supposed to keep it till the last minute. They ruled the judge was wrong, that he should have not allowed that tape in. My attorney had asked for a 30-day continuance. They said my attorney was completely in his rights and should have been granted extra time to prepare for that videotape. But just because there's a mistake, an error, and a mission does not mean you get a new trial, does not mean you go free. After they determine there's a mistake, an error, they then do what they call a harmless error evaluation. Did this mistake, did this error matter? Would it have affected the jury's verdict? In my particular case, the exact words of the Arizona Supreme Court was, Without this videotape, there wasn't even a jury submissible case against Mr. Crone. They recognized everything in my case was about this bite mark, that this videotape was critical, and they ordered a new trial. By now, a number of men had been executed on Arizona's death row while I was there. My family had come to see me on death row, seen me shackled to a table with one hand loose so I could pick up the phone to talk to my mom to my sister through the glass. They seen the condition I was in. They seen the condition of other prisoners, the way we were treated. And we were concerned now because we knew this wasn't going to go away quickly. We knew the state of Arizona could and would execute you. Didn't really care if you were guilty or innocent just so they could close their books. My folks mortgaged their home, cashed in their retirement funds. Friends and family members collected donations, took up, sold homemade goods, and we were able to hire an attorney out of California. We still can come near $100,000, but he was familiar with my case, believed in me, said, let me take the case, just pay the expenses. My second trial started in February of 1996. It lasted six and a half weeks. Over 500 exhibits were introduced. We had three bite mark experts testify for the defense. My mom, my, my dad, my sister came out from Pennsylvania, sat there each day in that courtroom. Friends in Phoenix would get off work to come in there and hear on certain days to have the hear, hear the testimony. We found out that the bite mark that was made on, on the victim's breast, they had actually taken a DNA sample from there. We found out that the DNA did not match me. You can imagine how good that sounded to us in that courtroom, that finally the truth is coming out. 
but I still didn't get it. I still didn't realize how important a death penalty case is to a prosecutor. This is how they advance in their career. This is how they climb their career ladder. Go on to higher pay. It's a win at all costs game when you're dealing with the death penalty trial. I'll tell you how far this prosecutor was willing to go. The prosecutor is the last person to address the jury before they go out to make their deliberations, before they go out to decide your fate. And that prosecutor stood in front of that jury, told them to disregard that DNA. It has no bearing on this case. He said she's a waitress. She handles glasses and bottles all day long. That was just transferred there by accident from somebody else's glass. He told the jury that they're responsible to see that justice is done for Kim and her family. That he knows who committed this horrible murder. He's sitting right here in the courtroom as he pointed to me. He said, don't let the defense mislead you. That's all they've been trying to do this whole trial. The jury was out for three and a half days. Came back and found me guilty again. I look over, I see the jurors, there are, there are tears in their eyes. The judge that's reading the verdict's voice is breaking up, he can't hardly finish. My attorney's hanging on my shoulder, crying, and I, I don't understand, I don't know what they're thinking. They, uh, it's not over, Ray, I'm with you to the end. I look over at the prosecutor's table, and they're all jumping up and down and celebrating. And I, I'm, I'm thinking, whoa, uh, back up, that's not what you meant to say, that's, no, you know, start this over, that's not what's supposed to happen. I, I just couldn't comprehend what they just said, guilty. But I'll tell you what really got my attention, what tore my heart out, is that at the same time when they said guilty, I heard this most horrible wail, this scream, this moan from my mom and sister not five feet behind me. To turn around and see that look, that pain in their eyes. Mom, don't cry. Mom, it'll be okay. Amy, I'll be all right. Don't worry. I'm her big brother. They were just doing it to me. They were doing it to my family. Five months later, I was before the judge again. Again, I told my attorney, I have nothing to mitigate. I didn't do this. He said, I know. You let me handle this. And this example of a man that's dedicated to his profession, a man that does his utmost, his best, he said, you let me handle this. And for the next two hours, he went over all the pieces of evidence that came out during that trial that pointed to someone else's guilt. Why footprints in the kitchen were the murder weapon, a big butcher knife, was taken from. Same footprints in the men's bathroom where Kim's body was left to lay. Footprints on a towel floor that the police had used a, a special powder and a, and a special light and take, took pictures of these footprints. Went and bought the exact shoe to match a size nine and a half converse. I wear a size 11. My bare foot was bigger than the whole shoe. Why fingerprints in that men's bathroom, on the sink, on the paper towel dispenser, on the trash can, where the murder weapon was washed and dried and hidden underneath the trash can? Why those fingerprints, palm prints, did not match me? Why DNA on the body, hair found on Kim's body, did not match me? When my attorney was done, the judge said that this case would haunt him for the rest of his life. He said it was hard for him to believe that someone with my background could have committed this murder. He said this mitigated the aggravating circumstance and instead of sentencing me to death, he sentenced me to 25 to life instead. And then went on and added 21 more for the kidnapping. I was facing 46 years in prison before I'd ever have my first opportunity at parole, 46 years. I was 35 years old when this happened, so you add 46 to that. It was a death sentence. I wasn't going to be laid on a, on a gurney and had a lethal cocktail shot into my veins in the name of the good people of the state of Arizona, as they say. But I wasn't going to live to be 81 years old, not in our prisons. Our prisons are very violent. They are run by ga prison gangs. I've been through a number of riots. I've been stabbed a number of times, pepper sprayed. Our medical 
facilities are horrible. Most of the doctors and nurses that work there are there because they lost their license to practice. So it was gonna, I was going to die in prison. But my family, my friends still believed in me, were still fighting for me, trying to find out any way they could to find the truth to get me released. And the years were going by. I'd see in the newspapers people being released because of DNA, and right away I'd think, yay, that's great, because that could be me one day, because I'm innocent too. And then on the other hand, I'd, I'd think, yeah, a lot of good DNA did me. Finally, in 2001, Arizona State Legislatures passed a new law. By now, DNA was being very creditable, very reliable, very dependable. Current laws only allowed you a short uh, period of time to bring up new evidence. If not, it was too late. So they made a new law allowing you to bring up DNA evidence anytime once it's, once it's found, if it was properly maintained, and if it would have direct bearing on guilt or innocence. We found out that Kim's clothing that had been cut off of her and thrown in the corner of the men's bathroom had been saved, preserved by the Phoenix Police Department. We requested that clothing to be tested. We had to go to a hearing before a judge. The prosecutor showed up, told the judge that don't grant this motion. It's a waste of the court's time and money. Mr. Crone's been convicted twice of a jury of his peers. It's overwhelming the evidence of his guilt, Your Honor. There's no need for this, this DNA testing. He did it. Well, for whatever, for whatever reason, that judge ordered DNA testing to be done on that clothing. Then he ordered the Phoenix Police Department's crime lab to do that testing. After all I've been through, the last people in the world I wanted to trust was the Phoenix Police Department. But it turned out to be a blessing. It turned out, out to be fortunate for me. Because see, in America at that time, law enforcement agencies were the only people that had access to a nationwide DNA data bank. Just like fingerprint information was being stored all over the country, accessible from any, any police station, now DNA samples were being stored all over the United States. In Arizona alone, there was about 16,000 DNA samples. And when this, this lab technician had found DNA on her pants, found DNA in her underwear, it was the same DNA. Compared it to me, it wasn't me. Compared it to the victim, Kim, it wasn't Kim. This lab technician, on her own, decided to see what would happen if she put it in the nationwide data bank. And it came back with a match. Came back with a match to a man at that moment right there in 2001 was serving a 10-year sentence for having sexually assaulted a child just a month after the murder. A man who was on parole at the time of the murder for having committed another sexual assault against a woman, had spent four years in prison, was released to his mom's house, whose address was just a few blocks away from the bar in Phoenix, Arizona. My attorney went to question this man who was just three months from being released. He was American Indian. He had a history of alcohol and drug abuse, a, a history of, of physical abuse by his parents. And right away, he denied being the, in the bar. Under further questioning, he admitted that he had a problem with alcohol, that he'd have frequent blackouts. He went on to say he remembered getting in an argument, being in the bar, being in an argument over the bathroom. He went on to say he remembered waking up with blood on his clothing and wondered what happened, what did I do? This was called an admission of guilt. He didn't confess to killing her, but he admitted to elements of the crime. And this had been tape recorded by my attorney. So with that DNA evidence, with that admission of guilt, my attorney went to the prosecutor's office. The man that put me on death row, told him, look, Ray's innocent, here's the proof. You know what that prosecutor said? He's not going anywhere. We know he did it. We have the bite mark evidence. He wasn't interested in the truth, did not want to hear it. Fortunately for me, there was somebody in Arizona that was interested. A local newspaper reporter got a hold of the story, did a little research, a little background, 
Next thing was front page banner headlines about how a man about to be released from prison committed a murder, how me, Ray Crone, was serving a life sentence after being on death row, and I was clearly innocent. Very well written. It was the truth. It was honest. It was also very, very embarrassing for the police, for the prosecution. The next day, I got called over to the counselor's office in the prison I was at. He handed me the phone. He said, your, your attorney's on the line. And I answered, and my attorney said, Ray, how you doing today? I said, fine, just another day in paradise. He laughed. He said, well, what are you hungry for? I said, well, I'll eat whatever's in the cafeteria. He said, no, really, what do you want to eat? Steak, seafood, Mexican food, beer, what would you like? I said, Alan, what are you talking about? He said, I just got off the phone with the prosecutor's office. They just got back from the judge's chambers. They're cutting the paperwork. You're coming home today. I wasn't sure what I just heard. I, I, I was shaken. I'm, I'm not breathing very well. My heart's beating. I said, what did you just say? He said, gather up your things, Ray. It's all over. You're coming home. Four hours later, I walked out of that prison, looking over my shoulder, wondering, what are they up to now? For 10 years, they did not believe me. They did not want to hear the truth. But I walked out that gate to start my life all over again at the age of 45, to reunite with my friends and family after 10 years, three months, and eight days. Also, when I walked through that gate that day, I had the distinction of being the 100th person in America to have been sentenced to death and later be freed to be proven innocent. 100 mistakes were made in America. Groups all over the country were waiting for that number, 100, a magic number, 100. They had uh, different vigils around the, U the U.S. They actually lit up the, the Colosseum in Rome because of my release. And the media was there waiting to ask me questions. What was it like to welcome me home? How did I survive? How does it feel? I talked about the support from my family and friends. I talked about how I read the Bible front to back three and a half times during those 10 years. How I slept with it under my pillow. Reporter in the back raised his hand. He said, Mr. Crone, given your faith in God, how do you justify him leaving you in prison for 10 years? How do I justify God leaving me in prison for 10 years? How do you answer a question like that? I, I just walked out of prison five minutes ago. My, my mind's blank. I, 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 no, there's nothing, I can't think of anything. All of a sudden, some thought shot into my head. and I said, well, you know, maybe it's not about those 10 years I spent in prison. Maybe it's about what I have to do the next 10 years. Since that time, I've been traveling and telling my story. I became involved with a group called Witness to Innocence the only national organization of death row survivors in America, men and women who survived the death sentence, who were later freed from death row. And we are, our, our, our mission is to empower uh, these exonerees to be able to raise their voice, to speak about their, their experience, to educate the public, and to bring about legislative change, to bring about abolition. I want to end this with, uh, with my thanks to all of you, to Amnesty International, for that fight, that strength that they gave us in America to carry this, to carry on the fight, the battle, the many years that we've been at it for abolition. Because you may not believe this, but the, number, the amount of funding, the amount of letters, the amount of support that we felt in America from, from Europe, from Amnesty International, from all of you, made a difference in our lives made a difference in our motivation, a difference in our struggle. It was encouraging. It was empowering. And I now have an opportunity, not just for myself, but for all the other men and women in the United States that struggle to fight for abolishment of the death penalty, that struggle for human rights around the world, I now have an opportunity to be a voice for them. And I say thank you, and thank you very, very much.
Oh, good afternoon. Um, I need to say that um, Ray and I have been together for about seven years now. Oh, thank you. Obviously, I've heard his story before, um, and I know how it ends. Um, but it's still very emotional for me to hear it. Um, I would also like to thank Amnesty International and all of you for all the work that you do in supporting abolition in the United States, and especially your support of a group called Witness to Innocence that Ray mentioned. Um, there are many ways to approach abolition and to try to make people see why the death penalty is wrong. Sometimes approaching it with the view of how it violates human rights is the best approach. For some people, it's the fact that it's more expensive to execute someone than to give them life without the possibility of parole. The approach that Witness to Innocence uses is the one that you have a possibility of executing an innocent person. As was mentioned, there are 142 exonerees in the United States. And there have certainly been innocent people executed. In addition to abolition, one of the focuses of Witness to Innocence is compensation. Freedom from death row is a wonderful thing, but that does not solve the problems. No one's life is given back to them the way it was the day they were arrested. These men and women have lost their jobs, their homes, their personal belongings. They have nothing. That's not quite correct. What they come out of prison with is something. They come out with physical health problems, mental health problems, and emotional health problems, and no help. As a woman, I can look out into this room and feel very confident that the worst thing that's ever happened to me in my life has happened to another woman in this room, and this is a pretty small group. For Ray and the other members of Witness to Innocence, there are 142 people in the entire country that can understand what they've been through. We can sympathize as much as we want to. But unless you're talking to someone who understands what you've been through, you're not really communicating and getting, being able to express your feelings. Excuse me. So again, I, I wanna thank Amnesty International and everyone in this room very much. Um, as Ray mentioned, the support that we get from you in the United States really does make a difference for us, and we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Eta Cheryl, abrimos un turno de, de palabras, comentarios o lo que, lo que os salga de dentro. Venga, ¿quién rompe la...? A mí me gustaría preguntarle a Ray eh, si él es optimista con la, abolación, con la abolición de la pena de muerte en Estados Unidos. Eh, me imagino que lo será, porque si está trabajando es porque cree creerá que tiene alguna opción, pero bueno, no sé si, si la puede cuantificar. ¿no? Absolutely, uh, because of the team I have with me. Uh, I'm part of, the, uh, part of a worldwide team. Um, most of you all have, have started and belong to that team a lot longer than I have. Uh, but just some examples of the progress we made. In the last six years in the United States, six states have done away with the death penalty. No states have brought it back. Um, another example of progress, um, there's been different legislative acts now making it easier for DNA testing to be done. There's legislative acts correcting some of the way that police do uh, photo lineups. Some of the, some of the problems that have, that have been 
uh, that have resulted in wrongful convictions are being trying to be corrected within the uh, the, the uh, law legal uh, writings, case laws. Um, and another thing that shows clearly progress of the message is getting out to the public is the fact that in the last two years, death sentences have continued to go down. Juries are not handing out death sentences like they used to. There is a reason that they don't believe in this uh, or, or, or in, in, in the death penalty anymore. Uh, the message is getting through to them. And for, for those of you um, that, that, may, that probably are not aware with our, our justice system, in America, on a death penalty case, the jury is death qualified. That actually means that you can only sit on a jury in a capital murder case if you believe in the death penalty. If you're opposed to the death penalty, you cannot be on that jury. So here you have a jury made up of people that support the death penalty and are not handing out the death penalty. Clearly, we're getting the message through. Uh, there's a lot of optimism. There's a lot of reason. And again, one of the last things, and maybe the most important, is the fact that the media now has brought its attention to bear on the fact of wrongful convictions, on, on, on misconduct uh, by prosecutors and by police. Uh, the message is definitely getting to the public. That public passes it on to our legislatures, and eventually those legislatures make the new law, and that says no more death penalty. lugar quisiera agradecer a, a Íñigo y a, a los eh, eh, miembros de Amnistía Internacional por organizar el acto y, como no, por la presencia eh, impresionante de, de la persona que, que ha vivido esa eh, terrible experiencia. ¿no? Mm. Eh, lo primero que, que, que quisiera transmitir es que eh, yo eh, he estado a, podía perfectamente no haber venido a este acto. Y he, he pensado inmediatamente, bueno, ¿qué hubiera ocurrido si no hubiera venido? Si no hubiera estado presente para escuchar este testimonio. Pues eh, hubiera, me hubiera perdido eh, lo que es también una experiencia terrible una experiencia única, que es la de escuchar directamente a la persona que podría estar hoy eh, eh, muerta en nombre de la justicia, en nombre de, de, de todos esos valores. Podría no estar aquí. Eh, esto lo, me voy a llevar a casa, este, esta cuestión, y le voy a dar muchas vueltas. Uh, pero bueno, ahora al, como, como pregunta, quisiera preguntar a este hombre que ha venido hasta nuestro país para contarnos esta experiencia, quisiera preguntarle, ¿alguien, alguien te ha pedido perdón? ¿Alguien se ha acercado a ti y te ha mirado a los ojos? Y te, ha, y te ha pedido perdón. Eh, y otra pregunta es, ¿cómo tú, eh, qué, qué, qué opinión tienes ahora de todas esas personas que mantienen ese aparato, esas estructuras eh, que, que han estado a punto de, de quitarte la vida? ¿Qué opinas tú de ellas? ¿Cómo las valoras? ¿Cómo las consideras? Escarri Casco y muchas gracias otra vez por estar aquí hoy. Um, actually, there was one person strong enough, man enough, if you will, in this case it was a man, to come and look me in the eye and apologize. It was a juror on my first trial. It was almost 20 years later. <laughs> um, I'd recently done an event in Phoenix, Arizona, telling my story. Also had people that were involved in my case. My lawyer was there, one of the people from the prosecutor's office, not the one that put me on death row, but one of the ones behind the scenes that fought for my release. The crime lab technician that was responsible for the DNA was there. And we gave a, 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 a st told the story of how this all came about from the different perspectives. There was also a man that showed up that was on my very first jury, the one that had sentenced me to death. His wife had said how for the, the one day he was driving in the car and one of his friends from high school had called him up and said, remember that jury trial or you, that murder trial you were on? 
That guy was just released. He was innocent. His wife said that from that day on, he'd been broken up about it. And he finally now, after 10 years, found out that I was in town, was able to come and, and see me. And with tears in his eyes, that man apologized. You could tell the pain that he suffered, that he felt. How horrible it must have been for those years for him to sleep. I tell you, that's the kind of people we need in this world. It's the kind of people that, 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 that try to do the right thing, try to you know, recognize when there's a need for an apology. That You look a person in the eye and you tell them you're sorry. On the contrary, on the opposite end, the day I was released from, from court, the head of the prosecutor's office, the head of the police department, did a press conference. At which point they announced that Ray Crone was being released, it appears that he was innocent, you know, it, it, it appears that a mistake was made, and if Mr. Crone was innocent, what can we say? We'll just have to do better next time. I was approached about an hour later by a, 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 a reporter and asked me what I thought of this apology. And I said, what apology? I don't know anything about it. And he showed me on his camera this little two-minute thing about how they were going through and, and saying if Ray Crone was innocent, he would be owed apology. And I said, apparently they're raised different here than where I'm from, because where I'm from, you look a man in the eye and you tell him you're sorry and you mean it. I said, that's not an apology, that's a running for office. I did also have the, the fortune, uh, about three years after my release, I was called to the, st the, the capital of Arizona, the, 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 the state building, at which point the, one of the legislators stood up, it took 10 minutes to tell my story, all the legislators stood up and said, on behalf of the state of Arizona, we're here to apologize for what happened to you. Uh, I wish my family and friends would have been there. They were deserve, deserved that same apology. Um, but I'm told it was the first time it ever happened in America by a legislative body. Uh, so only a few people ever, ever stood up, were able to come and tell me that. Um, and the people that were directly responsible did not. So in answer to the second question, that is a, is a perfect example of what our justice system has become. Arrogant, egotistical, uh, they, don't, they won't admit they made a mistake. And I think it's not to, I mean, we're human beings. We all make mistakes. It's not the, the caliber of an individual fact that you make mistakes. The real, the real telltale sign of what, what the, of the, of the, of the good character the humanity in that person is what they do when they realize they made a mistake. Do they admit it? Do they stand up and take the blame for it and apologize for it? Or do they try to blame somebody else? Do they try to cover it up? They try to deny it. And for too long, our justice system in America has been trying to cover up their mistakes, been denying it, been blaming somebody else, not taking that responsibility. So finally, I take a little bit of pride, and the other men and women and witness innocents take some pride, and certainly other groups in America take some pride in the fact that we're going out and telling the public now what does, what can and does happen. Would you want that to happen to your children? Would you want that to happen to your family? Raise your voices. Let your legislatures know. Uh, it doesn't make up for those 10 years I spent in prison, but it gives a little bit of justification, at least a little bit of reason of why I was meant to go through this. Uh, and again, with y'all's help, we're going to keep that fight going. We're going to keep taking it to them and keep making them realize to the day that they can finally apologize and the day they finally realize we can't fix the system because we can't fix people, uh, but we can certainly make sure that we don't kill anybody anymore. No more questions. Muchas gracias por venir, ha sido muy interesante y me ha parecido muy curioso que has dicho que los fiscales en Estados Unidos no pueden dejar de, de cumplir la pena de muerte, incluso suben en categoría que los fiscales en Estados Unidos suben de categoría según jornadas de problem. Switch back here. Eh, ¿Ahora se oye? Sí. Sí, sí no, eh, que me ha parecido muy curioso. Eh, 
se va, ¿no? Que en Estados Unidos eh, los fiscales suben de categoría según condenan a muerte a, a los inculpados, ¿no? Y eso me choca terriblemente qué clase de justicia es esa que hace, ¿no? Que, que también eso esté en medio de la justicia, ¿no? Que tengan que subir unos a costa de matar a otros, ¿no? Cuando muchas veces no tienen ni culpa. Nada más, gracias. Uh, actually, you're right. Um, in a system where you're the power, where you're the control, you make the rules fit the way you want it. And that's what has happened over the years in, in, in America. The prosecutors weld most of the power now. Even in the courtrooms, they, in a lot of cases, they're telling the judge what to do. Because they are political, uh, they're, they're elected by the people. And they tell the people that we're here to represent the good people of the state, whichever state it is. And also, they're the ones that the public looks to when there's a horrible murder, an outrageous act committed against another human being or a group of human beings. This is the prosecutor who stands over saying, I'm going to see that justice is done. This person will not live through, this person will be executed. And I'm the one that's going to do it for you, to give you closure, to, 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 to help your family heal. I'm going to take care of this for you. And people want to believe that. We don't want to think monsters are running around in our streets killing our children or our wives, or, you know. And so the people have become blinded to how these prosecutors and their ego and their minds work. And eventually got to the point where those prosecutors were able to make the laws all in their favor. They became judges. They became legislatures. There is no accountability by a prosecutor in America. They have total immunity. They can withhold evidence. They can perjure themselves. They can perjure a witness. And nothing will happen to them. That is certainly out of the lines with what most of our checks and balances in our government and most, most of those checks and balances meant in our, in our justice system to prevent that type of th thing from happening, for one human being running control, uh, a dictatorship in the justice system. S slowly it is changing. Um, and the reason is now because the public's becoming aware of it, because of the number of exonerations because the number of outrageous acts that some prosecutors have went so far to do. If you never get in trouble for nothing, how, where's the line? Where do you stop uh, violating uh, people's rights? Where do you stop taking advantage, uh, you know, afraid of being caught? I'll give you an example. In my case, that prosecutor that was responsible for sending me to death row, it was one of the top prosecutors. He, there's been two other of his convictions that were released from death row. Well, he just retired last year. He got a meritorious service award, outstanding achievement, outstanding lifetime achievement award by the district attorney's office in Phoenix, Arizona. He got awarded for it. We can't stop it immediately, but the more we talk about it in America, the more the media hears about this, the more letters that are written to people, to, to uh, governors, saying, why does this happen, the sooner it'll change. Bueno, a mí me han llamado bastante la atención eh, diferentes cosas, pero me voy a centrar en dos. Una, que creo que la exposición de Ray ha sido el mejor ejemplo de que la justicia es igual para todos, sigue siendo una gran mentira. Eh, el que tiene mucho dinero tiene posibilidades de acceder a la justicia y el que no tiene dinero, pues le pasa lo que le pasa. Y en segundo lugar, yo quisiera destacar que por la... Eh, por la exposición que ha hecho, pues me ha parecido que Estados Unidos tiene un gravísimo problema con la pena de muerte, pero no un problema menor con la falta de garantías del proceso judicial. O sea, lo que nos ha contado ha sido todo un ejemplo de barbaridades desde el principio hasta el final, de, vamos, de atenerse exclusivamente a aquello que me lleva al objetivo que yo quiero y olvidarme de todo aquello que no me lleva al objetivo que yo quiero. Entonces, en vez de ser un proceso que, en fin, que intenta ser imparcial y que busca la justicia, pues parece que lo que busca es rápidamente solucionar el problema y pasemos a otra cosa. ¿eh? Y si matamos a uno, pues lo matamos y punto. Que total, si no se morirá en accidente de tráfico o algo parecido. ¿eh? Entonces, eh, no sé si, eh, si, si la lucha solo debe ser eh, contra la pena de muerte o... No sé si no es más importante luchar contra el proceso que puede terminar en una injusta pena de muerte. Bueno, todas injustas, ¿no? Pero no sé si 
el camino que lleva a condenar a alguien a la pena de muerte, pues no debe ser el objetivo por el que hay que trabajar para que sea un proceso con garantías y no un proceso chapucero y lleno de… de bueno, es decir, no lo voy a calificar, ¿eh? creo que ya es bastante… Uh, yes, very good. It, it, it's true. I, I agree with you. I, uh, I guess you could say our, our tree of justice needs a little bit of pruning, a little bit of trimming. Uh, we might have termites in certain sections, but it's not completely destroyed. Uh, we have, uh, this is only a few individuals that, 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 that take advantage of their position. Most of our, our prosecutors, most of our police officers, I firmly believe that they want to do the right thing. And they normally are dealing with, real, with the guilty people. Uh, not always. Not everybody arrested is guilty. Uh, but, but most of them are. But our system still, uh, that has those problems, until it acknowledges that those problems are, are, uh, are factual and are occurring regularly, they, they do not address those, those, those mistakes, those errors. And that's why it's continued for so long. And again, I'm a positive thinker. I, I do believe now that within the 10 years, even since my release, the small changes that I've seen, uh, it's hard to change a government quickly anyway, unless it's overthrown, and that's certainly not going to happen, but, but I do believe the small changes that are occurring is a result of the 20 or 30 years of people that have been, been pounding, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> that have been pounding on the doors of justice saying, fix these mistakes, you're, you're violating human rights, do something about this. For 20 or 30 years, the, those knocks weren't heard, it wasn't answered. Finally, you're coming to the time that, that it's finally being heard in America. Again, it's going to be a slow, slow process, but it is picking up speed. And there are people now in the country that are working towards that more diligently than ever. Uh, so please keep faith in, in America, and, and, and please believe that, that there, there are more good people there than bad people, and we will end up ruling the day. Sí, Charlie. Oye, ¿qué influencia tiene el factor social o el factor racial en la imposición de la pena de muerte en los Estados Unidos? Gracias. Uh, statistics have proven, and surprisingly, it's not the color of, of the perpetrator, it's not the race of, of, the, of, the, of the defendant, but statistics have shown that, that it's, the ra it's the color of the victim. If the victim's white, you're 80% more likely to get sentenced to death. If the victim's of, 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 a, of, a, of, a, of another race, a minority, it's only 20% likely of, of getting sentenced to death. Clearly, apparently, our justice system places more value on the death of a white person. Again, I'm sure that goes back to the days where, where uh, slavery, where uh, they weren't even human beings, they weren't even allowed to vote. Uh, clearly, and this, this is predominantly in our southern states also, it, again, it's because of the old slaveholders. But these are facts, There's, they're in figures. If any of you are ever interested in, in, in learning some specifics about the death penalty in America uh, that have access to the web, there is a web page called Death Penalty Information Center, DPIC, uh, D-P-I-C, and it has every statistic on, on the state, what states have the death penalty, how many are executed, how many on death row, a lot of facts and figures about the death penalty in America. Uh, it, it, there's some shameful things that go, uh, again, go on with, with the race issue. Uh, but but uh, uh, the, the biggest determining factor of all is the fact of whether you have money or not whether you can afford it. And I don't mean a few thousand dollars, I mean hundreds of thousand dollars. There's no rich people in our death row in America. In fact, a lot of our rich people, a lot of our wealthy don't even go to prison, period. But it, it really starts off with the money factor because uh, you have to hire, be able to hire experts, you have to be able to hire a good attorney, investigators, and you have to get on that case almost from the start because the police are the initial people on the scenes. You don't know what they're collecting or what they're gonna turn over to you. Uh, so the real difficulty is, is how much money you have uh, to start with, and it, incredibly so, then again, is something when, when, when race, as long as we've been fighting for, for racial equality, for, for racial justice, it, and it's still evident completely clearly from the figures, from the statistics, that race is a big, fa big factor in getting sentenced to death. Uh, again, it should be embarrassment, it should be something to be ashamed of in the system, but they cover it up, they deny it, they don't admit that it's true. Una pregunta más, algún comentario, reflexión. Sí. 
Kaso atxaldeon eta eskerrik asko zuen hitzen gatik. E, gobernua behak ezin aldu e, debekatu eriotzi gorra. Eta uste duzu e, debekatzen ez duen gobernu bat e, nazi hori demokratikoa dela? In America, because of our three-stage system, the justice system, the, the legislative system, and, and, the, and the executive branch, the president cannot declare the, the, the death penalty null and void. Because it's part of our judicial system, part of the laws, it has to be done by the head of our judicial system, which is the United States Supreme Court. If there was a case brought to them about the validity of the death penalty, and they ruled that the death penalty was cruel and unusual punishment, and from that day on, there would be no more death penalty in the United States. The other way to attack the death penalty then is through the legislative branch, through our senators, through our Congress, who would have to pass laws that say that we no longer support the death penalty, that Americans will no longer be subject to the death penalty, and that would be, be, be uh, signed by, or that would be voted on by the Congress, passed to the president, and it would be signed. However, if it went that way, I would guarantee you that attorney generals in other states would fight to have to say that that was unconstitutional, that, that, that the government wasn't allowed to do that, and would have it tied up in courts for a long time. The real and true way for us in America to have the death penalty abolished on a national level is for the U.S. Supreme Court to say it's cruel and unusual punishment, that it does not meet the constitutional requirements, and that in that case it will no longer be. Uh, that has happened back in 1973 when they ruled it was 72-73 when they ruled it was, was unconstitutional because they cited the exact words were arbitrary and capricious, meaning it was too, too un, unfair, it, was too un, it wasn't written well by all the different states, and they abolished it throughout the country and made each state come back and rewrite the way that they per, uh, 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 pursued the death penalty. Uh, each state had to rewrite it and make it more um, clear and concise with exact procedures how they were going to go about it in order to reestablish the death penalty. But it would take the U.S. Supreme Court to completely abolish the, the death penalty and stay abolished in the United States. Berria egunkarian zure elkarrezeta bat irakorri dut eta iruditu zait e, esaten duzuna getik ondo irakorri baldima dut Hau gertatu aurretik erio zigorraren aldeko azinela. Eta gero berritzen noski orain badakigo zure jarri da zein den. Ez dakit aldaketa horrei buru zerbait esan nahi zen nuke? Uh, yes, it's, it's true. I, I mean, I, I was a supporter of the death penalty, if you will. I wasn't out on the corner saying, yeah, 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 kill them all. You know, I, I, it wasn't like that. I just thought what I was told and growing up in a family that believed in it. And, uh, you know, I'm from a rural area, a farming, agricultural area. Everybody knew everybody. Uh, the day I was born, you already had a reputation based on your last name. I went to the same high school my grandparents went to, the same church my great-grandparents went to. So you kind of believe certain things that your family believes. But I didn't, you know, I, I used the example that I had an opinion that was a mile wide and only this deep. I had an opinion that I believed in, but I, I never broke the surface. I never thought about it, because why? It doesn't affect me. It doesn't affect my family. It's not something I'm concerned about. Uh, I mean, uh, and then at the age of 35, I found out that it would affect, it does affect me. It does matter. Um, how many people are, are like me out there, it was the same way, believed in something that they were told, believed in what they heard, and while it's not going to affect me directly, I'll just have an opinion of it and go on. Uh, it always has been a polarizing thing in our country, just like abortion can be. Some people believe in it, some people not believe it. But how, how much thought did they, depth did they put into their thought, into their reason for that, that belief? Um, so I, it's easy for me to, now to, to be ashamed, to be embarrassed for believing in something. I questioned some of my other beliefs after that, thinking that, that, that I believed in the death penalty, that I believed in my government because they told me this. Even after serving in the military, you know, for six years, um, this was something I just thought that, that was true. It was only going to be for the worst of the worst. It was the last step in a, in a long line of people that had a, a, a criminal history and were the most violent and dangerous in our country. That's what we were told. That's what we were led to believe. We were lied to. It wasn't true. And of course, now I'm one of those that doesn't like to be lied to. 
But I'm not going to go lay in the corner and, 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 and try to hide and avoid the, the truth. I'm going to come out and speak about it. But fortunately for me, as there is a platform to do that, it's provided by the many of activists, the many of, uh, of human rights people that have been involved in this issue for so many, many years, that now me and the other exonerees that have come out of prison, that have gone through this experience, has a platform, a place, a support group to be able to talk about what happened. Uh, yes, I used to support the death penalty. I never will again, and I'll fight the day I die with the others that have fought for abolition. I'll be standing right next to them with them, and I'm proud to be, and I'm proud to be here with you all. Mr. Rick. Muchísimas gracias y hasta una próxima ocasión.